confirmation camp up at uh, our seminary in Fort Wayne. Uh, they left Friday afternoon, and I think they're worshiping at St. Paul at 10 o'clock, like right now. And then I think they'll be home after that. Is that right? Oh, 8 o'clock at Redeemer. So they're probably on their way home. Okay. Well, we know they went to church parents, so don't worry. Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Grady would have made sure of that. I know him pretty well. So, Okay, so we're all good there. Uh, let's see. Any other announcements? I can't think of too much. You know, we're, we're in the festival season now uh, of Easter, so services are probably going to be just a little longer than normal. we got such wonderful music. Man, are we blessed with phenomenal musicians or what? Let's, uh, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a Pentecostal day. Let's just give thanks. <laughs> Great job, musicians. Uh, wonderful. Just, it's just glorious. So, okay. Are we live yet, young man? We are live. Okay. All right. So we are in the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm not going to write everything on the board today because we're kind of short on time anyway. So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, remember, this, this is not John's revelation. This is what Jesus gave. Uh, John was told to write down what he saw, what he heard, um, and, but this is all straight from Jesus, all right? So we are finishing up now our study of the uh, seven churches. So remember, we've kind of talked about what numbers mean. The number three represents... God, Trinitary, and that's an easy one, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, number four is the number of, of man, if you will. Uh, three plus four equals, oh good, you still know your math, right? And so we've got seven letters uh, to the seven churches. Uh, seven really uh, you know, represents a couple of different things. Uh, one, it represents Christ's church. Um, which is obviously connected. Heaven is open to us in the divine service. Uh, so, and that's the other reason we have seven candles as well. Usually candles come in numbers of seven. Um, you don't have to. You can have as many or as few as you want, but that's kind of why that is. God created the world in six days. On the seventh, he rested. Okay? Uh, sometimes you'll see an eighth candle pop up. Newness, new day in baptism, that sort of thing. If you were at the wedding yesterday, you've heard it all before and you're smarter than me. So, okay. Let's go ahead and have a prayer, and then we'll jump into uh, Revelation uh, chapter 3, I think is where we are at. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, so let's see where we need to pick up here. I think we, are, we should be on Philadelphia, correct? It's been two weeks here, and I've had a holy week in between, so I was kind of looking through this last week. So I think we covered Sardis, right? Did we not cover Sardis? Yeah, I thought we did. We should be on Philadelphia, right? I want to do it again. I don't care what you think. I'm joking. Okay. Let, let's, let's, let's review Philadelphia just because that's kind of what I prepped for. <laughs> don't you love pastors? You got to be careful with them after they've come through Holy Week because you just don't know where they're going to end up, okay? All right, so uh, Philadelphia, let's just, uh, just pick up and follow along. So this is uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Are you sure we did Philadelphia? I'm going to have to go back and watch the YouTube. All right, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Oh, yeah, we did cover this. Why did I forget this? That's okay, we're going to do it anyway. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. 
I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So just to review, as we've looked at each of these letters to each of these cities, uh, we see a few things. The first thing is the emphasis on the Word, right? The words of who? The Holy One. So what's the image of Jesus here? It's the true one, so that's unity. <clears throat> and unity, that's the same. Pay attention to Thomas's confession, right? I'll mention that for you late service people in the sermon. My Lord and my God. So that is a uh, a shema, a confession, really of unity, of the humanity and the divinity um, of Jesus, that he's both human and divine at the same time, right? So that goes all the way back to Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, the first shema, confession of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, is one, right? So uh, they were monotheists. And Christians are still, we are still monotheists, right? We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God, right? But three persons. So this is echoed here in Revelation. He's the true one. He has the key of David. So pay attention as well in our gospel text for today. Jesus gives the keys to the apostles, right? Uh, Keys to bind sin and to loose sin, okay? Um, So this is echoed as well. He has the key of David who opens and no one will shut. So it's all about forgiveness. Forgiveness is only found through who? Through Jesus. Thus, I would submit to you, there is only for, for, for a Christian one forgiveness. And you say, oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. I mean, there's my forgiveness, And I would say to you, no. If you're a Christian, you forgive because God in Christ has forgiven you. So when you say to someone, I forgive you, that doesn't mean that you forget what they've done or necessarily that you're okie-dokie with what they've done because Lord knows you and I are sinners and we have memories like elephants, don't we? When it comes to people who have wronged us. And so how in the world are we able to forgive? Are we Jesus? No. There's only one Jesus. Thus, there's only one forgiveness. And that's why it's so important to forgive other people. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So when you screw up, say, I'm sorry. I repent. And when someone says that to you because they've wronged you, you better say what? You better say, I forgive you. In fact, Jesus is very clear on this. When we fail to forgive others, <laughs> what's the problem? Who knows their Bible? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're putting ourselves, uh, you know, that's, uh, in the words of my grandpa, that's uh, don't stir dried dog doo-doo. Or I remember when I was a little kid, I went out in the pasture And I saw this big round thing, and I wanted to jump up and step on it. And Grandpa said, don't do that. That cow patty looks dry on the outside, but I guarantee you it's not on the inside. And Grandma's going to yell at you if you come in the house with those shoes. So that's the problem we get ourselves into, all right? So one forgiveness. I know your works, Jesus says. So we've heard this before. He knows your sin. You can't hide anything from him. And so we do, we, we really, we think we're smart people. I mean, we hide things from, you know, you name it. And, and maybe not always intentionally, our friends, our spouses, our teachers, you know, our bosses, our co-workers, you know. But guess who always knows? Jesus. He knows your works, okay? He knows your sins and they're not good. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. So the gospel is always there. So God desires all people to be saved. So, so the door is, is, is always open. And that's wonderful, you know, for faith. And of course, not everyone will believe. Okay? We'll, many, many will reject. 
I know that you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word, this church at Philadelphia, which means brotherly love, okay, uh, 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 phileo, uh, you've kept my word, have not denied my name, uh, and now we've got an issue again of unbelievers of the synagogue of Satan. Jesus doesn't mince any words here. I mean, remember, Jesus is the one who said, you're either for me or against me. Now, our world today would say, that's ridiculous. I talked to somebody the other day, and, and you know, somebody uh, that's uh, struggling a little bit and, and, and having some issues, and, and they talked to a, uh, you know, a counselor, and, and this particular counselor, you know, suggested just some good, you know, general things, you know, diet, you know, exercise, you know, uh, uh, this person was having a hard time, you know, kind of sleeping at night, maybe a little melatonin, you can, you can get that over the counter on that sort of thing, and, and, then, and, then, and then the counselor said, oh yeah, and then I need to go to a witch to get this certain flower, and he calls me and he says, everything sounded so good, it was just this holistic stuff, but I got to get a flower from a witch. What do you think about that? And I said, run away. <laughs> Don't have anything to do with that. Now, the, the flower, and, and I mean, there's, there's natural holistic I take supplements. Maybe you do as well. I mean, that's all part of how God has created it, but don't go to a witch to get it, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, uh, now why? Now, this particular counselor was, was of, of a more was self-described kind of naturalist. And so anyway, so the, this person that I was helping ended up, you know, talking and saying, well, you know, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm a Lutheran, what do you believe? Well, you know, I believe Jesus was a real person, but just a regular person, you know, and, and I believe that, you know, there are, there are spirits everywhere and we can tap into their power and, oh yeah, you know where the conversation went after that, right? Now Jesus would say, you're either for me, you either have faith in me or what? Or you don't know, our culture today would say, you know, all roads lead to heaven, all dogs go to heaven, that sort of thing. You know, this very uh, universalism and no, Jesus is very clear and we're really hearing that emphasized here uh, throughout the book of Revelation, okay? So city of Philadelphia was founded and named after Attalus II. Uh, whose devotion to his brother uh, Eumenes gained for him the epithet, the, uh, the, the phrase brother lover. That's actually where it came from. So there's some neat little history behind it other than just brotherly love. Uh, it was founded in 138 BC. This was a trade center for the rich volcanic region north of the city. And Attalus then founded Philadelphia as a center for the spread of the Greek language. And so because of that, it had a certain kind of missionary character from its beginning. However, it was subject, Philadelphia, to frequent earthquakes. Okay? Um, it was a small city. Uh, the congregation likely here that uh, Jesus is speaking to was quite small. Uh, it's also located in a vine-growing region, which means the, the cult of who was probably pretty dominant. How many of you know your Greco-Roman uh, mythology? Uh, or Dionysius, okay? Um, so there, there was a cult there of Dionysius that was very prominent. So they liked their wine. So if you're a wine drinker, this was the place for you, okay? I keep looking in the Bible to find which city was the Bourbon city, but I haven't found it yet. So I'm going to put uh, uh, Steve Voteman on that as head elder to figure that one out for me. Um, so there's, there's difficulties, obviously, for the Christians there in the city, um, that seemed to have arisen as well from the Jewish opponents. And so for the unbelieving Jews, Jesus calls them what they are, you know, synagogue of Satan. You know, Luther, you know, wrote in a very vitriolic way against the Jews. And, and there, there were some things in how he said them that probably weren't appropriate. But to be fair, when, when Luther is writing against the Muslims or the Jews, he's really following some of what we're hearing here in Revelation as well, that when you fail to believe in Jesus Christ, if you're not for him, you're against him, okay? Now, at the same time, um, you know, we have this, you know, we have the rest of Scripture which tells us to, you know, uh, to love and be hospitable to the foreigner, you know, in our gate and, and love our neighbors, even unbelievers. And so, 
you know, for us as Christians, it's, it's a balancing act, right? Uh, we, we don't want to become so connected that we're easily swayed by their beliefs, okay? Uh, but we also, you know, d- d- don't want to just be completely standoffish either. And so the goal is always to have an opportunity for the gospel, um, but be aware of the other beliefs and teachings so that they don't influence you and your children as well. And that's the challenge for parents, right? I mean, they make new friends, and of course you want to know, hey, what do they believe? Where do they go to church? What types of video games are they playing? You know, I mean, you just just want to know about some of that stuff, and for good reason. Um, and so be in the world, but of course not, not of the world itself, okay? Okay, any other questions on Philadelphia before we jump into the one you tell me we're supposed to be on today? You're good? Okay, so now we've got uh, Laodicea, correct? We didn't cover that one last. There it is. Man, my notes are all out of shape. Okay. So let's, uh, let's pick up at verse, uh, verse 14. Oh, the last thing there in Philadelphia. So God promises he's going to write his name, you know, on them. And, of course, we're going to hear this through Revelation as well. So question for you, when were you given God's name? Very good. You were given God's name in baptism, okay? And if you don't understand what that means, then you need to go watch Toy Story. Oh, yeah, you need to go watch Toy Story. Because what, are the, what does the little boy do with all of his toys? Huh? What, now, what does he do on the... What, what's, what, what does Woody... What's on the bottom of his boot? Is the boy's name. He write, the boy writes his own name. He claims his toys by putting his little name on the bottom of it. And I'm not saying Toy Story is overtly Christian or anything like that. But it's a great object lesson because most of you have probably seen Toy Story, you know, fun movies, all that. Andy's name is on the bottom of the the cowboy boot because it's his toy. Okay? So now God does that with you. He writes his name on you, claims you as his own, which means he's going to watch over and protect and care for you. And so you've been given his name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Holy Baptism. Okay? Now you probably never connected Toy Story with baptism before. And I'll probably get yelled at by somebody online for even saying that. Oh, that's sacrilege, Pastor. But God claims you. He gives you his name. So however you need to help yourself understand that, it's an amazing thing. And it means an amazing relationship, um, and not just by yourself, but also with all the other toys. I mean sheep, right? All the other dry bones, okay? All right, anything else on Philadelphia? Any questions? Laodicea, 14, to the angel of the church, and remember the angel is who? Pastors, although don't, don't, your pastors are not angels, <laughs> okay? Angel means messenger, so it's their job, they're, they're messengers, okay? And, and if you're unsure about that, just talk to any pastor's wife, and she'll clear that up really quickly. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, okay? Read this with me. The words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So right off the bat, here's, here's the logos, okay, uh, or plural here, the words, okay. And now Jesus is referred to as the amen. Now amen, uh, translated normally in the New Testament, is what word? Truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, okay, or as I will normally translate, amen and amen. So from your catechism, what does amen or amen mean? Yes, yes, it shall be so, right? So it's true, it's real, it's factual, it's trustworthy. So when you are saying your amen, and you should say amen, right? I mean, don't just say it for no reason, right? I'm okay with people saying amen in church. Actually, you say it a lot through the divine service if you pay attention, okay? Now, don't be interrupting my sermon or interrupting the readings. You know, don't, don't, you know, don't just use it as kind of your own personal exclamation point. Uh, it's a word that means something, but it's also a word you should use, and you should truly believe it when you say it, okay? Because whenever you say amen, you're saying pretty much, I believe. That's great. That's correct. 
So we see that also Jesus is the one, as we saw in Philadelphia, he's the one, there's unity there, uh, divine and human, okay? Uh, he is now the true one, the real one. He is the amen. He is the faithful and the true witness. So if you pay attention to everything that Jesus you know, teaches, he says very pointedly, everything I receive from the Father, I passed on to you, right? So Jesus takes all that he has seen and observed and all the God that the Father has given and now gives it to you, okay? And he gives it to the church. He gives it to the pastors who are then to give it to the churches, which is why we have these letters as well, okay? Now, what do you have the great joy of also doing with it? Well, one, okay, dads and moms who help with that in the home, you pass that on to who? To your children, right? And as you have opportunity, as it may come up in the conversation, you might talk with, uh, with your neighbor. You might talk with a coworker. You might, you know, have an opportunity to do that. That's not your primary job, your vocation to be a pastor or a missionary, but, you know, be ready to give a reason for the hope that, you know, is within you. Never shirk away from that, okay? And, and above all, Scripture would emphasize that, you know, let others see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. So the other thing that we always forget about the evangelistic task is simply by just doing good works, <laughs> That God has prepared in advance for you, by the way. You don't have to go looking for good works. And Luther talks about this a lot. There's plenty for you to do if you just think about your daily life. So if you do what he's given you to do as a mom or as a dad, guess what? That's evangelistic. Okay? Just doing, your, doing the work that you've been given to do. You don't have to go out of your way to look for something. Okay? Um, and God will provide different things and opportunities for you to do. Okay? All right, so he's the faithful, he's the true witness, he's also the beginning of God's creation. That's a neat little uh, connection there at the back. So Jesus, obviously without flesh on, was there at creation. He was the Logos, the word that God spoke, that went out, that did all the creating. Okay, follow along with verse 15. Any questions? Okay. I know your work, so here we go again. Uh Uh-oh, I can only imagine where this is going to go. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Say, rut row, not a good situation here. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, you all, you understand all that, so we can just move on to chapter 4, right? What? Okay, so Laodicea, let's do a little background and then we're going to dive into this whole stand at the door and knock thing. Some of you might have a, a picture hanging in your house or you've seen one, you know, and I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, you know, see if it's got a door handle or not in the picture. <laughs> okay, that, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Just hold, just hold on to your shorts. Okay. So Laodicea is located about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. Uh, this city was founded in the 3rd century B.C. by Antiochus II, who named it in honor of his wife, Licorice. No, it's Laodice. Laodicea or whatever, okay? Under Roman rule, it became a flourishing commercial center noted for woolen carpets and clothing. So if you wanted carpets made of wool and good clothing, this is where you would come. It was a prosperous city, um, and thus we have these references, especially there in 17 and 18. 
right? Um, they said they need nothing. They, they're prospering. They've got everything they need. Um, the church was possibly established, the Christian church there, uh, by a guy by the name of uh, Epiphras of Colossa. And we hear a little bit about this. If you go to Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 4, you can read just a little bit about that. This might have been the result, this church here in Laodicea, of some of that missionary work. Um, at the time of his first Roman imprisonment, when, when Paul was first imprisoned in Rome, um, he had not yet visited the, the Lycus Valley, which you can read about in Colossians chapter 2. Um, but in Colossians 4, it seems that Paul uh, later on then seems to have known some of the mem- members by name. Okay? So there's some interesting connections between um, you know, these churches and, and what we have in a few other places of Scripture. Okay, um, so let let's get into this uh, th- this whole concept here um, of uh, of just this knocking at the door. So let's go back and look. We got about eight minutes left. We're not going to cover it completely, but we'll be pretty good. So the first thing is that they're neither cold nor hot, right? They're lukewarm. So w- which which simply the way you need to understand this is, you know, nobody knows really what their confession is. What do you really believe? Okay. Where do you really stand? And the rest of Scripture would say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And instead of saying, yes, I believe, or no, I don't believe, they're kind of like, eh, whatever works. (laughs) We just kind of want to get along with everybody, right? So so whatever whatever works, you know, and and that's really being hypocritical in some ways. Uh, And Jesus says in in, in this instance, if you're not for me, you're against me. And that's exactly what he's saying. So if your confession, your faith now is not, you know, true um, and, and it's not something that you, you know, really cling to, then I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, okay? For you say, I am rich, so now this is the thing is, I have what I need, you know, or I have my faith, I don't, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to confess my sins with the fellow toys, I mean, sheep. Okay, I, I can just, you know, be on my, I've got my faith, I'll just kind of be on my own, um, I don't need forgiveness, I, I don't need to come and, and eat the Lord's Supper together, you know, you see where we're going with this? I kind of have my faith, I, I don't really need that, I mean, and then, and then people will ask questions like, well, do I really need the Lord's Supper every Sunday, you know, I mean, you know, maybe we should just go back to, you know, four times a year. You know, because, I mean, my goodness, it makes the service 15, 20 minutes longer. I mean, come on. We should have more time for coffee and donuts and stuff like that. But you see where we're going with this? Now, be honest. And even as a pastor, I got to tell you, I mean, the service this morning, like last Sunday, was just absolutely beautiful, right? And I really didn't think I had that long of a sermon. My wife said it was 16 minutes. But here's, here's the sinner in me. I get done with the sermon. What's the first thing I do? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, that's way too long. We're never going to get out of here. No, I'm, that's me. I'm your pastor. I mean, this is what I do for a living, and I enjoy doing it, right? Uh, but you're thinking, oh, I gotta, we, okay, maybe I need to cut something out, you know, for the next service. Like, nah, they'll just have to deal with it. You know, you, you go back and forth, right? That whole Satan sinner thing, right? Um, and so for you say, I'm rich. I have what I need. I prospered. I need nothing, but fail to realize that I'm still a sinner, and so we want to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of, you know, the whole once saved, always saved, which is a heresy, an error. Uh, that eh, I was baptized. I've had people tell me this. I was baptized. I haven't been in church in a long time, Pastor, but, but it's okay. You know, Andy wrote his name on me. You know, I'm good. And I'm like, oh, you know what Jesus says? If you're neither hot nor cold, he's going to spit you up. What? It's like, yeah, do you you recognize you're still a sinner? Don't you need what he has? Oh, I never really thought about it that way. Well, maybe you should. But, you know, because we're we're, we're completely sinners, and and there's sin there that we don't even recognize. And Jesus, yes, he died for all of it, but he, he wants you to live in your baptism, not live with your baptism, live in it. Daily die to sin and rise to new life in Christ. That that's a totally different thing. Okay? Um, goes on then, and now let's jump into where you're going to have some questions, and we might have to pick this up next week, okay? So he he wants to get, don't, don't, 
get too far into the, I cancel you to buy for me gold refined by fire. Jesus isn't saying you can buy salvation, that sort of thing. He's connecting the dots to the city of commerce, you know, that they, they spend so much time trading in goods, you know, buying with that. He's saying, hey, instead of focusing on your prosperity and your business, I want you to now think of, of your salvation, your spiritual life in this way. Why don't you do business with me? As much time as you put into doing all these other things, the clothing and the wool, why don't you think about you know, coming to church, about having faith, okay? So Jesus isn't saying you can buy salvation. He's just saying, hey, let's, let's, let's have a relationship together, okay? So that you may be rich, but not tempor- temporarily rich or temporarily rich, spiritually rich, okay? And then great connections here, white garments. What are the white garments that Jesus provides? Baptism again, right? Um, so you may close yourself. The shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Salve to anoint your eyes, right, so that you may see. Um, those whom I love, and now he talks more about what this relationship is going to be like. Yeah, there's going to be discipline. Meaning, I, you know, I'm going to come and I'm going to deal with some things that you're not doing right or sin in your life. Okay, But that's part of my love for you. Right? So it's the same thing that we, we, we told our kids. I don't know if we had one kid that we spanked more than the other, but, you know, I mean, I, I just kind of did what my dad had always done. I mean, if they needed a good swat, yeah, they got it. My kid's over here nodding his head, but we, we always sat him down before I gave him their punishment or their swat as, you know, this is what you did wrong, and, and this is now your punishment, okay? And then give them their punishment. And then would never just send them on their way after that. Would then would hug them and tell them that, you know, normally they're like, I'm so sorry. He's like, I forgive you. And, and we love you, right? Uh, just because you're being punished and disciplined doesn't mean that we as parents don't love you. We're doing this because you need it, because your behavior needs correcting, right? Now, this is on YouTube. I'm going to be arrested for child abuse probably. But it's all through the Bible, Right? So, so discipline and, and correction, and God's saying, hey, this is the way I'm going to love you. Uh, so be zealous and repent, which means to recognize your sin, and, and then just say you're sorry, right? And, and that's been the hardest thing for a few of our kids. They've, they've gotten much better at it now, but to just simply say, I'm sorry, because the sinner in you doesn't want to fess up, doesn't want to admit that you've sinned, doesn't want to, Okay. Um, but now, thanks be to God, you've got a new man in you that loves the law of God, and so don't, don't suppress that new man. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't be lukewarm, okay? Um, okay, goes on here. What do we got? Two more minutes. Oh, my goodness. There's so much good stuff here, okay? So those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, and here's what I want you to do with this text. I want you to connect it to the sermon and the scripture passages for today. I want you to think about Jesus who continues to come to the apostles and the women who truly yet don't understand or, Scripture even says, truly believe in his resurrection. But what does Jesus do? He keeps coming back. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Which means Jesus is doing what? He's trying to get your attention. Because if you hear somebody knocking on the door... And we live in a subdivision that has no solicitor signs. So we don't get a lot of people that knock on our door, right? And so when that happens, I'm like, my first thought is, who's going through the neighborhood? You know, I, I hope it's somebody, a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. That's okay. If it's somebody selling me siding or roofing, I'm going to be very unhappy, right? I mean, you know, you, maybe you're that way as well. And, uh, you know, but Jesus is getting your attention. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm here, Right? If anyone hears my voice, you know, opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now keep in mind, who's doing the work first? Jesus. Who's coming to you? Jesus. You're not going to him. You're sitting in your recliner or your comfortable sofa with your feet up on your ottoman and your favorite blanket, you know, watching whatever it is, Masters or Hallmark, and, but Jesus, he just keeps. And that's a good thing he does. Otherwise, you'd be stuck there in your living room or your den or your favorite place, right? So he comes. 
Now, we're going to pick it up. We're going we're gonna to be done here today. We're going to pick up just a little bit more of this and talk about where some people twist this text to turn it into decision theology. It's absolutely not decision theology. It all starts with Jesus, but we're going to cover that next week. Okay? Let's stand and close with the Lord's Prayer. Thanks for your time and attention today. Sorry we didn't have as much time as normal, but I'm not going to apologize for good scripture and wonderful Easter music. The Lord be with you. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us again to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. He is risen.